Yes, so I'm going to bring you into a different world, really. We've heard a little bit from higher ed and from business ed. So the work I'm involved in is iSchool, is our organisation, and we provide access to education for young people who've left the formal system it's um, without qualifications. It's a complex issue. Uh, our students come from a range of backgrounds and there's many reasons why they are online with us. They might have mental health issues, behavioral issues, anxiety, socioeconomic disadvantage uh, from traveling backgrounds. So whatever the reason, we respond with personalized online courses that they can access from anywhere. So some of our students go online from home or if the home circumstances aren't suitable or supportive, we've connected with and made partnerships with host youth services and agencies around the country as well, where the students can go in and access their online courses there. And that's more specifically what I'm going to talk about today is that blended model and the partnership with the host agencies. So the students for this particular pilot project that was a development out of our current model. Uh, we'll meet some of them here. You'll see some of the lads that uh, we were jumping a bit to the end. This was the graduation of some presentation of some certificates, but uh, I can't lie, actually, it's not all of them. The guy on the right photobombed this. He grabbed a cert and a trophy, maybe off Betty Boo or something there, and jumped in because he wanted to get involved in the excitement of the whole thing. So the Young people, were, there were 30 of them. They hadn't learned online with us before. They were between 12 and 17. They were identified as at risk by services of criminal behavior, antisocial behavior, drug, alcohol, misuse. Uh, they hadn't been in school for between two and four years, so their experience of education was very limited and often very negative. Our aim for these students was to progress really their ability to fulfill their opportunities and to engage in further education and employment. The aim for our tutors online was to create a safe place for them to learn. So why informal and formal learning, to go back to the, to the question? We had begun the process of bringing them together. We had personalized learning programs that students could access in the learning centers. But we knew that a lot of these centres had activities, project work, professional youth workers that were engaging these young people very successfully in group work, but that we weren't accessing the accreditation opportunities that were available for them there. So we wanted to develop an approach that first tested online courses as that bridge between the informal and the formal learning environment to see what impact that might have on student ownership of learning and also to see what the boundaries between the roles and the responsibilities were for youth workers and tutors in online circumstances and in blended centre settings. So what that actually involved, what the process was and what we began with was de designing content briefs and assessment rubrics. What we needed to do, though, was ensure the integrity of the original approach that we know, knew worked. We have the experience that we know already at this stage that online learning can provide personalized, flexible, adaptable content. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we could still do that. The assessment rubrics needed to make sure that the technology uh, was still being able to be used for the ongoing digital portfolios and assessment. And all across this, all of these elements had to be able to be provided uh, to individuals uh, online and to groups in a centered settings. And the support and the interaction had to go across the online tutors and the support workers in the centres as well who are providing face-to-face -face mentoring and personal development programmes. So for this group of learners, we were really looking at uh, Level 2, uh, European Qualifications Framework, personal and interpersonal skills and personal development the building blocks of what they needed to know before they were going to be able to engage effectively in further learning. Things like communication, 
uh, working in teams, interpersonal skills, identifying their own behaviours, identifying challenging behaviours, and how to be able to deal with them. Literacy, numeracy, digital literacy, all of the elements and the components that was going to, to be able to empower them to learn into the future. So as we developed the courses, what emerged was a, a multidisciplinary learning environment, effectively. So if you can imagine, the students were going into the centre. Uh, there was six centres across the country, so it was a national pilot. There was four urban settings and two rural settings, so there was a good spread across as well. The students went in five days a week for three hours, so there's an element of, of flexibility there. The informal learning environment allowed them to engage in a setting that they disengaged previously from a traditional school setting that had really set unrealistic and irrelevant expectations for these students. So they were able to go in for the first hour of the day, they went on to their own personalised learning plan and this allowed them to get their their headspace right, but it was also very important to them because you can imagine some of the content that we were looking at around personal development was very personal to the young person. So identifying your own strengths and weaknesses, your own challenging behaviours and how you're going to deal with them needed to be done in a way that they could just do it by themselves uh, without being challenged in a, in a group situation and to be able to explore and inquire elements of their own learning in, in a safe way. They also had a range of literacy and a range of numeracy, so it was all very the online piece where that individual one hour was self-paced. As they engaged with the content, the online tutors examined that evening the interaction with the content and they would have a daily refreshed learning plan ready for them for the next day. And this is where project-based learning started to fit in beautifully for us and we could see really the potential of it because it embedded those pieces of integrity that I was talking about just earlier. It allowed the students to engage at their interests. They were deciding what they wanted to work on in the centres. Because there was a range of rural and urban settings, there was a range of local needs uh, in terms of the projects they identified. So cooking was big. Um, they wanted to, by the end of the 12-week programme, to be able to cook a three-course meal for their families and community members, uh, which was a large task for some of them, and as one mother would said, said to us, that it, took, it was, had taken her 15 years to try and show her son where the kitchen was uh, and what pots were, but uh, over 12 weeks, you know, he'd cut a lot of onions and he was able to, to get to it. Uh, horses was another thing. There's a, there's a strong connection in Ireland in urban settings between young people and their horses. Uh, they bring them, they have them in estates, they keep them on small greens, but they don't know how to care for them properly, so they wanted to learn how to do this. Mountain biking, art design, these are other pieces as well. So you can see across there, really, the, the essential elements of project-based learning fit into what we did already, but provided a framework for assessment and accreditation that our tutors were able to develop courses around. So what that began to look like, really, was that PBL was a carefully designed approach. Uh, we had knowledge, skills, and assessment, but we also had attitude, and this was really important for the groups of learners. The division of responsibility started to look like the, the assessment, and when we say formal learning in this context, what we mean is uh, learning that's going, to be, that's going to have an outcome of qualifications and, and accreditation. So they were able to acquire the skills, the resources, uh, the pieces of um, information that they needed in their interaction with online content. They were able to apply them then uh, in the two other hours in the group setting, apply them in the face-to-face -face work with the mentors. And for the assessment, the online digital portfolios allowed the three elements of assessment there, the learning journal, portfolio of outcomes and the group projects to be able to be recorded in a multimodal way. So what we did there was that the evidence was photographed, videoed, 
blogs that allow them to reflect on learning were able to be done by video, uh, by audio, by also by text if they wanted. And the planning and the facilitation of the group project was recorded on forums that was, interact that was uh, facilitated by the online tutors. And at the end of it then, a video and showcase of the presentation was done for all the projects. So the outcomes that we saw, uh, maybe we could turn the sound down on that video. Yeah, it's not really necessary because it was one of the challenges. Uh, mountain biking was another thing, and, and this was uh, a challenge of assessment. The uh, collection of assessment evidence from some group activities. So this was a group of it who had identified they wanted to go mountain biking. It involved a lot of health and safety stuff. They also wanted to go go-karting. Uh, Oddly enough, there was no uh, support worker in a centre who was putting their hand up to go down a mountain on a, on a bike with a camera on their shoulder that showed the group doing the, the, the activity. Uh, so there was a kind of a messy element there, the collection of evidence. Uh, some challenges as well was around the information transfer between the online tutors and face-to-face -face mentors and the balancing sequence of group activities and individual learning plans. Effectively, what we saw in the challenges there was probably there wasn't sufficient training for the workers in the centres in the approach that we were trying to develop. So we would see the next step as really bringing together all that learning and the next thing is to provide that professional development piece as well. The outcomes were amazing, um, I would say in terms of accreditation. For the 30 learners, there was 24 of them that achieved two qualifications at EQF level two and three in personal development and interpersonal skills. Bear in mind these were young people who had achieved no formal credit accreditation or qualifications previously. Uh, another two engaged in the course didn't have the assessment uh, portfolio complete but they did the whole thing and uh, two disengaged from it so did not complete at all. We measure success and outcomes in terms of progression as well and this is probably the key to the puzzling title and it's it's going back to the what i was talking about and this strong connection with the horse that exists in many communities in ireland and many urban communities as well and i'm going to give you a fact now that i think i can guarantee that you've not heard any other time in the conference uh, over the last three days and that is that the, the horse equine industry in Ireland is worth 1.1 billion per annum to the local economy. That's very significant in a country when you think of the population of 4 million. How that's relevant here is that you can see, this is one of our guys on the left. This is the before picture. This is him on his horse in the city. Uh, you, you'll see this a lot in Dublin, in Limerick, in, in Cork, and in, in place, a lot of places. They have, it's more than an interest, it's more than a passion. This is their connection with the horse. They want to make a career out of it, and there's a huge amount of career development opportunities available in Ireland for it. The challenge for them is that, you know, you'll see him there, no hard hat, no saddle. This is how he's learned from, from when he's this high. This isn't going to get him into Jockey Academy. This isn't going to get him into the school to be able to, to provide employment. So the group he was with identified that they wanted to go to, to learn to ride in a posh riding school as they saw it, because they knew that they needed that ability to be able to get engaged in uh, a system that was going to provide them with work in the area they wanted to work in. So after 12 weeks, you can see where he was at. Uh, there he is in a center uh, with the hard hat on, with the saddle. This is a big deal for them. Most importantly, being able to take instruction from someone in a riding ring. Maybe he could do with some work on the shoulders, but I think maybe that's the next, wor next course is the deportment on the horse, but you know, we'll see how that goes. But the essential thing here is he's now connected into a course that provides him with the next step to go to jockey school, which is the race academy in, in Kildare in Ireland. 
So it's allowed him from the start, where we were blending the online course accreditation that provided our young people with a safe place to engage in education in an informal setting. The successful outcome is accreditation qualifications for sure, but the real successful outcome is the ability for them to be able to progress and engage positively and actively in their own futures. Perfect. Thank you very much.